Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be looking at the bishop d2 a3 sideline in the Vinever variation of the French defense. So the French defense is when we have the moves e4, e6, d4, d5, and the Vinever is when white now plays knight to c3, and black plays bishop to b4, and the main line continues with e5, c5, and the sideline we look at today starts with bishop to d2. Black can go for c takes d4 here, although it often gets very sharp. After c d4, white can play knight to b5, and it's pretty important that black not trade the bishops over here because white's development will just come very quickly. Best move for black is to play bishop to c5, but this is a very sharp and very theoretical line. And instead, I like to play knight to e7, just keep things simple, keep things fairly consistent with other sidelines and move orders and stuff. After a3, and white does have a few other moves they could play instead of a3, white could play knight b5, or d takes c5, which we looked at in the previous video. Best thing for black to do here is play bishop takes c3. If black retreats, that's not good because black will lose this pawn on c5. If black tries to win it back, pawn to b4 actually comes with tempo and will save this pawn. This will be a very annoying pawn for black to deal with. Black will probably have to trade their b pawn for it at some point. So that's just not good. Best to just take takes back. There are actually quite a few moves that black can play here, but I like Grandmaster Geary's recommendation. It's an idea that we've seen in other lines, which is just to try to trade away the light square bishop and also add some support to the pawn on c5. And in this position, it's worth talking a bit about pawn to b4, which is kind of the secondary move that white will usually play here. In the line today, we'll be looking at bishop to b5 check, but very quickly, if white plays pawn to b4, or this not only attacks the pawn on c5 again, but it also gets ready to meet bishop a6 with pawn to b5. So after queen to c7, defending the pawn, and also opening up some discovered attack ideas. If white plays knight to f3, then we take here, getting the bishop. After bishop takes pawn... Bishop to a6 now works because the b-pawn is gone. And if instead white tries queen to d2, then we can take over here. And then regardless of how white takes back, we just put the knight on c6. Like for example, if bishop takes back, then the knight still comes here with tempo because we are attacking this guy. I, and overall black is doing okay here. Black has succeeded in shattering the center. And black is just going to keep developing and, you know, I'll have a reasonable position. This position has not been reached very often. There are not that many games that feature it. But anyway, back in this position, the main move that white will usually play is bishop to b5 check. We've seen this idea before. White is basically giving black a bad tempo. Oh, like trying to prevent the trade by forcing the bishop to d7. If the knight goes to d7, then the bishop still can't go to a6 anymore because the knight is needed to support that. So bishop to d7, after bishop to d3, we can just keep developing, knight bc6. And now here, most common moves for white are either knight to f3 or pawn to f4. thought I should talk very briefly about pawn to f4. Here, it's actually best not to take on d4 since... That pawn, like, you won't actually really be getting to keep that pawn there. It's very hard to actually defend it. Like, if you take this thing, then white will just move their bishop and eventually win the pawn back. So this pawn will not really be ours for that long. Instead, it's best to just kind of take some space and maybe expand on the queen side with pawn to c4. After bishop to e2, knight to f5. With some nasty threats of queen to h4 check, 
So pawn to g4 is no good because queen to h4 check. And king can't go to f1 because of knight to d3 check. And if king goes to d2, then knight will take this pawn. And so white will generally play pawn to g3 to stop this nasty stuff. And then black can play pawn to b5 and start expanding on the queen side. I like this is a pretty cool position. This is pretty fun, but there have not been that many games that feature it. So I thought instead of looking at pawn to f4, we'll look at knight to f3. And now a very cool idea by black that has been played a good number of times is queen to b8. And it's actually very hard for white to hang on to the pawn pawns in the center here. Like, white is most likely going to just lose a pawn. Um, since it's very hard to save them, it's very hard to defend the pawn on e5, since the knight is in the way of the f-pawn coming to f4. And if white takes on c5, then that actually kind of helps black with their central control. Black can just take back with the b-pawn and have some very nice pawns on c5 and d5. So... Before continuing, I thought I should just introduce the players really quick. So, with the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Dimitrios Mastro Vasilis, who is a Greek Grandmaster. And, uh, let's see. He, he won second in the under-18 division of the European Youth Chess Championships in, uh, the year 2000, and he also won the Medit Mediterranean Junior Championship in 2003, and uh, let's see, won the Artemis Cup in 2012, and has very often represented Greece at the Chess Olympiad and the World Team Chess Championship, as well as the European Team Chess Championship. So, very cool stuff. And with the black pieces, we have Grandmaster Jan Nepomnici, who also goes by Nepo, like kind of similar to how Magnus Carlsen is often referred to as Magnus for short. And he is a very strong um, super grandmaster, master who um, was the world championship challenger in, uh, let's see, better make sure I get the year right, uh, 2021. And he will also, he is also a challenger in 2023, so in, in this year. And I'm actually really looking forward to his match with uh, Ding Liren. And he is, like, aside from classical chess, he has also come in second, second at world events for, I think, Blitz and Rapid and Fisher Random. It's actually very interesting that he able to grab the silver medal for pretty much everything and like that's that's pretty cool oh like extremely impressive hopefully he'll be grabbing the number one against ding ding lirin and uh anyway i don't have uh much else to say about oh grandmaster nafamachi he oh he also has a uh, course on the king's gambits on chessapool which I personally have been enjoying. And uh, this particular game took place at the World Rapid in 2021. So it, of course, was a rapid game, so there might be some small little inaccuracies here and there. Yeah. Although Black played almost perfectly the whole game. And, uh, and yeah, uh, more... More information about the players and events can be found in the video description. Back to the game. So, in this position here, the most common move for white is to just castle, and basically kind of play like a gambit. So, black can grab this pawn on, on e5 by first taking on d4. If white takes back with the bishop, then you trade, and then take on e5. So, white wants to keep pieces on the board since they're going to be going down a pawn. So instead of trading on d4 when the knight takes, we just grab the pawn right away. White lunges forward with pawn to f4. Black trades their knight for white's bishop. 
because Black realizes that White is going to be attacking them. White is down a pawn and is going to try to get an attack out of it as compensation. Knight takes bishop, queen takes bishop, castle kingside, get the king to safety because white is going to come roaring forward. We have rook ae1 getting the last piece into play. Hey, it's very important to try to use all your pieces when you attack. There are very few exceptions to that and this is not one of them. So black plays rook to e8, which is actually uh, the purpose of rook to e8 will actually be revealed very soon. White plays queen to g3, getting ready to do some potentially nasty stuff over here. Like, in this position, I think, I think uh, white might actually be threatening something like knight to c6, although there might be knight to f5, sort of a counterattack, that sort of thing. Something of that nature, although knight to c6 still does look quite strong, like if knight c6, knight f5, knight takes queen, knight takes queen, knight takes bishop, knight takes rook, rook takes knight, and then have this knight escape. I think white would be doing very well there. So black, given that this is a rapid game, was probably thinking, ah, enough of that, I'm not going to let that happen. We now kind of see part of the purpose of rook to e8, it's actually to indirectly defend this pawn over here. White cannot take it with either piece, like, for example, like, obviously, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. Obviously, if white takes with the rook, then black takes with the bishop and just goes up in exchange, even though white uh, would still have some pressure on g7 and things would be coming forward. And if white takes with the knight, black has a strong in-between move, knight to f5, I'm defending this. Hitting the queen and, you know, unleashing a discovered attack on the knight. If queen d3, for example, I can take with the rook. Try to trade rooks over here. Here, and then, like, taking with the bishop doesn't work because I think white can actually sack the exchange. Inge and after rook takes, play queen takes here, pinning the rook and also hitting the knight. So taking with the rook is actually better for black. The queen takes, pinning the rook to the king. There's queen to e8, and this kind of actually just holds everything together. Other because, um, basically, if queen takes knight, then rook takes rook. And, you know, if rook takes, then queen takes with check, and then bishop will take the queen. It's very important to develop visualization skills and stuff. That's why I don't always necessarily show all these lines. Like, sometimes just try to try to visualize it. But uh, anyway, black would be doing just fine here. Black would probably just move their knights on the next move. You know, something like that. Like maybe play knight d6. Just get it out of there. There. And black would be okay. Everything is kind of well defended. But this is uh, not what happened in the game. Instead, white probably saw all this. And instead went for rook to f2. Black play knight to g6. It's, you know, kind of defending this guy more directly now. We have pawn to h4. White is roaring forward, trying to attack. But black is in time to counterattack in the center. Very often when your opponent launches attacks on the flank, you want to counterattack in the center. That's just a, kind of a general rule, a general principle. And black is hitting the knight and also hitting this pawn. So white takes, and black takes back with the rook, because black wants to trade a bunch of stuff. Black is up a pawn, remember, so black is quite happy to trade away white's attacking pieces. And white decided to trade here. It might have actually been better for white to instead... Actually, no, the engine's suggestion is a little strange. The engine is suggesting to try to do this, but I don't really fully understand this. Let's just take a look really quick. Like, I was thinking just trade like this, and then engines being really funky. Do like that. Black's kind of still better here, so I don't really understand what the engine is saying. And black, black is still quite a bit better. So, anyway, white decided to trade. Black took back with the queen, activating their queen. Also attacking white's queen. 
in getting ready to maybe strike back, maybe do some kind of counterattack. And white decided to trade queens here. Black took back with the pawn. You know, a pretty dynamic choice since these two pawns, they do do a good job of controlling the center. But they're also kind of tricky to defend because they don't have, you know, their neighbors, neighbors here ready to defend them. So these pawns are a little bit double-edged. They're kind of similar to isolated pawns. I think I've seen Ben Feingold call them hanging pawns. Are they good? Are they bad? That's for the players to figure out. In my opinion, they were actually pretty good this game. Like Black is a super grandmaster, so they probably understand all of these nuances, at the very least, very instinctively. So White plays Knight to F5, and Black plays Rook to F8. The engine doesn't like this move so much, but I think it was okay. Like, basically, Black just wants to kind of trade some more pieces. But the reason why the engine doesn't like this that much probably just has to do with how it's going to lead to an opposite colored bishop endgame. Like, one approach that uh, the engine does approve of is to just play bishop takes, knight, and after rook takes, takes, then play, like, uh, pawn to d4, and then maybe try trading the rook like that, if I recall correctly, to make sure that that all works. Yeah, this is this is all good. Uh, in fact, don't even need to play rook f8. Can try like rook c8 or something. But rook f8 is pretty good. Like if bishop d2, rook to f8 is a very reasonable uh, approach. Like these pawns are pretty strong. They do a pretty good job of controlling the dark squares, all that kind of stuff. And then basically, if white goes rook g5, then you can just kind of give some backup to this pawn and basically play this endgame like black is actually doing quite well here although my understanding of endgames isn't super good although i have been getting better but basically the reason why this might be preferable is just that you avoid opposite colored bishops which can be very messy can be very tricky to work with but this is not what happened in the game Instead, we have knight to f5, and black decided to play rook to f8, trying to trade pieces this way. The engine doesn't like this as much, but this is all still okay. I think black is still winning here. The reason why this is a little bit messy is after pawn to h5, like, this knight was under attack, and it's very tricky to defend. And, like, basically, uh, black was getting ready to take, and then take the pawn on h4. So after pawn to h5, counterattacking black's knight, black takes this knight, pawn takes, bishop takes, and then here in this position, white went for rook takes f8 check right away, which is fairly intuitive. White is just going for opposite colored bishops. It's important to remember that this is a rapid game, although the engine actually prefers that white instead just take this pawn right away, because... Part of the difference between doing the rook trade like this versus doing it on f8 is that in this case, white's king would come out to f2 with tempo, whereas black's king is not on f8. But what happened in the game is um, uh, white traded like this, so it's now black who gets a free tempo out of the deal. Like we have bishop takes here, bishop takes here. Here, and we have opposite color bishops, but black is still doing quite well oh, over here. Like, opposite color bishops, they're not always necessarily a draw, even though they can be very drawish. Like, one thing that's actually very uh, counterintuitive about opposite color bishops is that it's actually better to have pass pawns that are not connected. It's actually better to have uh, kind of isolated pawns that are far apart. And the reason why is because connected pass pawns are much easier for the defending side to blockade. But, um, so the reason why this is not a draw is because, well, number one, there's still these guys on the board. There's still these pawns present. And number two is that, um, Black's extra pawns, like, uh, they are, they're kind of, uh, they're, actually it's these guys. 
I see are these pawns, and they're fairly far away from each other, so that's a bit more difficult for the defending side to deal with. Whereas um, uh, with uh, connected pass pawns, pawns uh, what uh, you would generally want to do is you would... Although with rook pawn, it actually does make it quite a bit tri trickier. You kind of want to have your king, king, and bishop kind of sit in front and then block blockade them, like basically stop them from coming forward in such a way that your bishop can uh, give itself up for uh, both of the pawns. pawns. And if the other pawn comes forward, you just kind of put your bishop along the diagonal and goes back and forth. But anyway, this is not a video about that endgame. Maybe I will make some endgame videos at some point. We have king to f2, king to f7, Bishop to b8. I personally don't think bishop to b8 really makes that much sense since black kind of wants to push their pawns anyway. Bishop to a7, b5. White plays pawn to g4. This move makes me personally a little bit nervous, but it's actually okay according to the engine. Like part of the idea of pawn to g4 is to just take some space, is to slow down black's king. But the reason why it makes me a little bit nervous is that the pawn is on the same color as, you know, the attacking side's bishop. So black plays bishop d1, trying to get this pawn to come forward even more so that maybe the king can come forward with tempo. White goes with king to g3. Black decides to restrict white's king. And again, you know, now it's black who's putting their pawn on the same color as the opponent's bishop, but... Here, I think it is a little bit justified since the king is fairly close and there is some backup potentially. We have bishop to e3, and now king to g6. And here, white played bishop to d2, which um, I don't like so much just because it allows pawn to d4. I think it was more resilient to just keep this um, bishop along this diagonal. But even that would not really be drawing, because black can actually sacrifice their bishop and use these these three pawns, like have these three pawns fight white's bishop, and black would actually potentially win this endgame. Like that's that's actually a resource that black has here. here so that's pretty cool. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, in this position, white played bishop to d2, and this was bad because black is just going to keep pushing this pawn down the board. We have bishop to b4, king to f6, bishop to c5, kind of misunderstanding that black is actually quite happy to just keep pushing the pawn. But it's rapid, you know, those kinds of mistakes are often made in faster time controls. h6, bishop to d4, check, king to e6. Bishop to c3, trying to stop this pawn. One thing that's very interesting is that even though these pawns do look like targets, white does not have time to actually attack them because black could just immediately sacrifice their bishop over here and then just play d2, d1. So black just plays king to d5. And it was in this position that white now resigned because white just can't do anything here. This bishop is tied up stopping, you know, the pawn from coming to d2. And this king is tied up, defending this pawn over here. Black is basically just going to come in like here and then just push their pawn on and win the game that way. Like, black can even sack their bishop for the pawn on g4 if they want, because as soon as black gets rid of white's bishop, black can just gobble up these pawns over here and white's king will be preoccupied with you know, staying in front of these guys. So overall, pretty cool game. Very, very well played by I Black. Like, the only move the engine did not like by Black was just allowing the possibility of opposite color bishops, but I think that move was still very reasonable. Overall, Black had an accuracy of 98%. And, uh, and yeah, I hope that you enjoyed. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye for now.